Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. Um, I used uh, uh, self-interest and subterfuge to lure one of my favorite guests back onto the podcast. Um, I often talk about Paul Bloom, who um, I looked on my Amazon Kindle recently, and he is tied with Paul Johnson for most books from a single author on my uh, my Kindle. Um, this sounds like faint praise because it's not like I'm a huge like psychology groupie, but like he's by far my favorite psychologist. And um, and he came out with a book last year, which we had him on for called Psych. And um, I saw him plugging on Twitter that they were going to have a that the paperback was coming out. And so I DM'd him and said, aha, now I have a reason to, to dragoon you back on. Would you like to come on and talk about the paperback? And he said, sure. So he's back. I, I responded with a hell yes in 30 seconds. I, I, and you have an, you're one of these guys that just has an open invitation. Is there ever, ever something just eating at you? Just let me know. We'll have you on. But Paul Bloom is professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. And Brooks and Suzanne, Suzanne Reagan, professor emeritus of psychology at Yale. Um, he's written a bunch of books. Um, the, my favorite is still, uh, just babies, um, in which no babies were harmed in the, in the book. Uh, but, um, his most recent book is psych now out in paperback, as I said, which is, uh, don't take my word for it. Cause I'm not really a good judge of this, but if you go read the reviews of it, it's considered one of the great introductions to what we actually know about psychology and, and in some ways more importantly what we don't know so uh paul bloom welcome back to the remnant i'm delighted to be here and thank you thank you for having me so we can skip the my normal question which is what's your book about because i did that the last time you yep. were on and instead we can um indulge my esprit d'escalier and um bring up something that i didn't bring up which is what the hell are we supposed to think about freud yeah um, you ask a hundred psychologists, you get a hundred different answers, but mostly, mostly they'll tell you Freud's an embarrassment. Um, it's like, you know, I, I put in my book, people treat it like a, a pharmaceutical company that got to start by selling meth, you know, and Freud, Freud sold the meth and we're kind of embarrassed about it. And uh, for good reason, just about everything specific Freud said about the origin of schizophrenia homosexuality, the role of dreams, the course of development, penis envy, Oedipal complex, is, is probably nonsense. But I'm actually a defender of Freud. I think he's a, a, a great thinker, wonderful writer, and his, his deep insights, take away the specifics, but his deep insights about the importance of the unconscious, unconscious dynamics, and, and all that, are true, and they're important. So I couldn't imagine writing a, a book that's supposed to cover all of psychology without spending a lot of time on Freud. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of part of the problem. I, was, I remember in the, the chapter on Freud, if you ask anybody who the most famous psychologist was, they're all going to say yeah. Freud. 99% of them are going to say Freud. And um, I guess the close second would be, the closest second would be Carl Jung. You know, I, I get emails saying, you know, dude, you didn't mention Jung at all. I, I mentioned him in passing. And Jung probably would be a second, but his ideas just haven't had the staying power. Yeah. And, and deservedly so, I think. I, 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 think, um, I think Jordan Peterson, uh, probably the most famous psychologist alive right now, um, takes Jung very seriously, but most people don't. And, and I don't think he has had a lasting contribution. I think Freud is first by, by a wide, wide margin. Is, now, I, I want to get back to Freud in a second, but on the Jung part, is it because he was really more of a kind of mythopoetic speculator kind of yeah. thing and not an empirical guy mythopoetic speculator is exactly what his, his twitter bio would be if he was around now <laughs> and um you know I, I i think he got some things right i think the idea of, of archetypes to the extent mm -hmm. i know about about them um captures something interesting captures the doctrine of innate ideas which has gone through our history and shows up in all sorts of different ways in different scholars but for the most part you know his, you know like Freud, he was wrong about all specifics. Um, unlike Freud, I don't think he had any general idea that had had that much uh, staying power. I, if I have the history right, Jung was the sort of the, the golden Gentile. He was supposed to be this guy who would, who would promote Freud's ideas by not being Jewish and hmm. becoming popular. But Jung rebelled against Freud, as, as students do against their masters, and there was all sorts of trouble. Was 
young, as crappy an individual human in his private life as Freud was? I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I saw a movie once um, but uh, about the two of them, but I, I don't know. I don't know what kind of person he was. Freud was definitely a mixed bag. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I'd be curious what you think about this. I, so just so people know, Freud was a, a nasty piece of work in his everyday career life social life all that kind of stuff um i don't know if he was worse than russo who was also a really terrible person you know this guy writes all this stuff about education and yeah how to raise kids but throws all his kids in an orphanage uh -oh. russo, russo was a famous hypocrite yeah I'm, I'm not sure in some way freud was um you know freud who was always candid about our dark impulses in some way, whatever, whatever you might say about his his bad deeds as a person, was was not being hypocritical. He was he was living out the the life he said that all people uh, the the dark motives he said that all people had. He was living down to his own standards. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so one of the things again, I am not a huge Freud guy. Um, weirdly, the most I've read by Freud would be his stuff about Woodrow Wilson, because people don't remember <laughs> this, but Boy, your obsession takes you everywhere. It really does. Well, he, I mean, it was, it's, it's, it's a sign of what a an unbelievably Titanic figure Wilson was for a little while in Europe that, uh, Freud either wrote or code wrote uh, this monograph of the psychological profile of Wilson is this great I man. I um, does, does, does Freud's take match your own? No, no, but very few people's take matches my own when it comes to, to, to Wilson. Um, I am, I'm, although people are coming closer to my position than I am coming to any of theirs, so that's progress. Um, but um, one of the things that I I do think is sort of brilliant, I can't remember if he actually deserves, you know, a lot of these things where you, we hear this someone was the coiner of a phrase or a concept, it turns out, no, they were a popularizer of it, and sometimes they were a thief of it. Um, but Freud's stuff on the... Nar narcissism of small differences or the tyranny yeah. of small differences. I think there's a real profound psychological insight to that. Um, and I was wondering, is that a thing that's still considered a real thing in psychology? You know, I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm struggling to think of research done or, or work done, but there's an enormous amount in psychology, as you know, about sort of in-group, out-group thinking. Mm -hmm. us versus them and you, you mentioned just babies and you like just babies because it, it builds on that theme right our natural desire to split the world in different tribes and um i think you know i i don't know freud's exact thoughts on that but but the idea that we are most repelled most angered by people who are very close to us mm -hmm. and disagree over small things i think captures a, a really interesting truth there's some joke about you know an, an anglican bishop you know, being fine with the practitioners of voodoo and the Orthodox Jews, but being enraged by this other Anglican bishop that differs on some sort of subtle matters of orthodoxy. And I think it's the same with academia and politics. We just get, get most upset when people close to us diverge. Yeah, there's a famous, very similar to that. Um, I don't know how apocryphal it is. It's been attributed to a zillion people. I went down, went down a long rabbit hole trying to figure out who first came up with it. But there's this story of a jewish man at a train station or an airport and the location varies who goes goes up to um uh, a hasidic jew and says you guys are such an embarrassment to us you're medieval this garbage that you wear come on join the 20th century the 19th century whatever you don't have to look like this and dress like this and then the man says oh i'm sorry sir i think you're confused i'm amish and all of a sudden the guy's, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. I, it's so great how you hold on to your traditions. You know, there is this thing about how we think we have ownership of a certain form of our identity. And when somebody can lay equal claim to it or partial claim to it, but does it wrong, that infuriates part of our that's right. brain. As, as a secular Jew, I'm not embarrassed by the Amish the way I might be embarrassed <laughs> right. by my, you know. Um, there, there is the story of the Jewish guy who, uh, who gets stuck on a desert island for many years. And when he's rescued, his rescuers find that he had built two beautiful synagogues. And they say, it's amazing. And he, they, what's that synagogue for? And he said, oh, that synagogue. I go, I pray every day. I pray. I pray to God. And I, I, I worship there. And he, then he pointed to the other synagogue. Why do you have that? And he said, ah, I never go there. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but this is one of the things which we did talk about, I think, last time about 
how much the how much we can think of sociology as the plural of psychology um you know because the narcissism of small differences isn't just an individual thing it's yeah. a whole societal thing i mean the i remember at my brother's funeral um we had this rabbi come and my brother's widow at the time she's since deceased as well was haitian and all her haitian relatives brought flowers and the rabbi was like thoughts great this is just it's not our thing but you know who first came up with this the jews and then he says but then the christians started doing it too and so we had to do something different so we started putting rocks on people's <laughs> you know uh, headstones instead oh um, is that true that's that's a... i don't know how true yeah. it is but it's kind of fascinating right yeah, I mean, that is fascinating there is that history in judaism of you know hanukkah is basically the story of fighting hellenization right i mean there's this need to be oppositional at a at a societal level um by owning some form of identity that you don't let other people glom onto and i'm just kind of curious i mean is there it seems like this is one of these areas where evolutionary psychology is more yeah. useful than any other kind of psychology there, there's an enormous interest in conformity in the forces that make you imitate the people you're you're close to and follow and follow their practices and 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 be like them um and some of this a lot from psychology a lot from other fields uh renee gerard who's sort of yeah, making a comeback these that. days yeah. you know talks about mimesis and and talks about the desire to adopt the, the desires of others but what you're talking about is actually less studied and which is um how how we don't want to adopt the preferences and desires of um of those who come from another group particularly group we're opposed to and i think that's that's perhaps even a more um a more potent psychological force if i'm in a high school maybe i want to dress like the cool kids but you know failing that i'll just wear whatever but i don't want to dress like the uncool kids right Right. And um, and and as always, social media, you know, exaggerates this to a tremendous extent where you have this oppositional response where when the other side says something, you immediately have to adopt the opposite preferences, the opposite views. And I think I think the oppositional stuff is probably stronger than the conformity stuff in our everyday lives. Yeah. I mean, there's also is a huge plays a huge role in all sorts of ways in politics where. You know, historically. I mean, historically, in the 1960s, the hard left hated the squishy liberal moderates far more than it hated conservatives. Right? Yeah. The conservatives were just this alien creatures. Don't pay attention to them. But it was the, um, you know, the sort of co-opting moderate LBJ type liberals that they had all of the scorn and hatred for. And today on the right, you see it all the time where this new right or hard right or whatever you want to call it, um, they they have all sorts of terrible things to say about the left, but the people that they you you can feel the real passion and hatred for are people like me, or Mitt Romney, or the yep. rhinos, that kind of stuff, because it is a desire to purify your own ranks, um, is the more powerful motivating passion I think in, at the political level than in the sociological level. But I, you know, just kind of curious about what is the psychological underpinning for all of that? Yeah, I mean, it's just. Tribalism is is a topic and a force which shows up across different domains. And I think one interesting thing is there's two separate things going on. So go back to your political thing. And one of the sort of weird things which has happened over the last decade, largely because of Trump, because all the weird things happened because of Trump, is the political flip and how the, the left and right think about Russia, about mm -hmm. the deep state, about CIA, FBI. And one force is that People are just following in lockstep with Trump. So Trump, you know, Trump appeals to, you know, is fond of Russia. If you follow Trump, you got to be fond of Russia. That's one force. But then the opposite force is all of a sudden, you know, the other side has to be, oh, screw it. No, the liberals have to be against Russia. Trump, right. you know, Trump criticizes the FBI, the CIA. And then you get the comic thing that these, you know, presumably radical people on the left, they're very fond of the CIA. We have to trust these people. And um, and so these two forces bounce around and, you know, just the psychology, the psychology of groups is sort of the tale of, of two things. One thing is the things that draw us to our group and connect us to our group. And the other thing is those forces that repel us from other groups. 
And um, I, 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 and I see an inevitability in all of this that, that what, what, you know, the world will become nicer, not when we get rid of all human groups and tribalism, but we simply make these desires harmless and playful, like in say sports or right. games. I know you listen from time to time, so I'm sure you scratched this off on your bingo card from one point or another, but my AI colleague, Yuval Levin, um, he makes this really, I think, important, he has this really important insight that um, I'm curious on your take on, uh, that I've had to sort of, that intuitively seems right, and I just had not given the weight to it that it should, which is that cynicism is actually really, really hard for human beings to maintain. And so, for example, in 2016, millions of people and dozens of my friends made a very cynical decision to support Trump because it was a transactional thing, better yeah. than Hillary, you've got to stick together, blah, 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 hold your nose, better of two, you know, better of lesser of two evils, uh, but Gorsuch, all that kind of stuff. And for huge numbers of them, they could not maintain that level of cynicism so that the cynicism just sort of melted away and they embraced sincerely new ideas in order to justify their choice, their continued yeah. support. Um, is that a real thing in psychology? Um, you know, is there a... You know, I, I remember in your book, you know, when you were talking about the Freud stuff, there was, you know, this, there is, there's this thing in your unconscious that there's some things that are so terrible that you have to sort of bend your consciousness around to deal with. But then again, Freud's not a, a considered a pretty legitimate source these days. So is this, I mean, how do you look at a phenomenon yeah. like that? In a few ways, probably the best modern incarnation of what you're talking about comes in the name of cognitive dissonance which is a, mm -hmm. a construct that social psychologists think about. And it's, it's the idea that these incongruities make us uncomfortable. If I'm, if I'm voting for Trump and hate the guy, I'm not very happy with this. If I'm, if I'm, if I'm you know, going to a job and I'm ashamed of it, that's not good. You feel this internal pressure and you want to resolve the pressure. And one way to resolve the pressure is you change what you think. So, you, if you know, you, there, there are these studies where you, for instance, you get people to lie about things. If you give them a lot of money to lie, they're comfortable lying. But mm -hmm. if you give them a very little bit of money and they end up lying about them, um, they start to believe they're true because they kind of got to tell a story about themselves. And you know, you gave me $10 to say this thing. That's very little money for me to tell the truth. So I guess maybe it is the truth. I'm not, I'm not a dishonest person. This is why, paradoxically, um, people who getting people to volunteer for political campaigns tends to make them true believers. Because mm -hmm. if you pay them, they say, I'm doing this for the money. But if they're doing it for free, they look at their behavior as if they were looking at someone else's behavior and say, well, this person's working for free. They must believe in the cause. And so um, similarly, it's, it's, it's an argument for why it may be a bad thing to do, for instance, to pay kids to read. Because mm -hmm. you pay kids to read a book, give them a dollar each time they finish a book, or I guess with inflation more than that, they'll say, I'm reading it for the money. But if you persuade them to get started without the money, they'll say, they may they'll say I'm reading it because I like reading. So that's one facet of it. Another facet, which has always interested me, and there's, there's, there's a lot of excitement about it, is that people differ in the extent to which, this comes under different, different names, but I think a decoupler. Mm -hmm. is one way people talk about it. And the idea here is that some, most people who aren't in the businesses that you and I are in have their beliefs, have their goals, have their commitments, and hold to them. And there's something very ugly about violating them. Mm -hmm. But some people are good at decoupling. So some people, you ask them, you know, so, okay, I know you're a uh, committed Zionist and everything, but tell me, tell me the view from, from Hamas. Just tell right. them. And they, they will say, sure, here's how it goes. And they will give a convincing rendition of it. Um, you ask some people and say, well, why is it wrong to have sex with a minor? And many, most people go, well, that's a disgusting question. I wish you didn't ask it. Well, mm -hmm. just, well let me give you the arguments. And decouplers are people who become political scientists, they become journalists, they become philosophers and psychologists. But hmm. the rest of the world sees these things through sort of a haze of taboo 
and the forbidden and forbidden acts and forbidden thoughts. And, um, and they don't like debating about them, these things. They don't like talking about them. And, um, and maybe they live happier lives. Yeah. So there's a lot there that I would like to pull apart. Um, um, but when we start with the word taboo, um, taboo is, a, was it, was it, is it, is it Robin Dunbar as the human universals? You know, it's one of these guys, there's one of these sociologists came up with this long list. Yeah, I think Don, of, Don Brown, maybe Don Brown. Yes. That's yeah. It. yeah. Definitely Brown. Um, and, um, and it's this list of things that are found in every single culture, right? Um, the form they take differs with different cultures and all that, but every culture has yeah. taboos against incest, taboos against uh, doing things with children, yep. gross things with children. Um, uh, and you can go on a really, really long list of, of these sorts of things. Um, as a conservative uh, 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 of the the previous era, let's just say, um, I'm a big defender of taboos. Yeah. Um, I think taboos play an incredibly important role in a healthy life uh, personally. And as a society, the problem is, is that every now and then there are some taboos that do need to be overturned. And yeah. that's, that's a long process. It's like, I'm a huge defender of tradition, but some traditions got to go. And sometimes it takes a while to, to recognize it. And I, I used to have these arguments with left wing, friends of mine um um in so far as i think one of the things that distinguishes the conservative point of view and the and the more progressive point of view is i'm willing to endure bad traditions and taboos for over a longer time horizon than they are edmund burke has this line where he says i must I must bear with infirmities until they fester into crimes, huh. right? Because it's, it's muddling through, it's progress. You need buy-in from the society. If you overturn established ways of thinking overnight, you're going to get a counter-reaction that's ugly and gross, yeah. and it's going to, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's my impression that people in your line of work um, tend to think all taboos are bad, except for the ones they don't, except for ones they like, which they don't call taboos. Um, is that fair? Um, no, but it's not. But, <laughs> it's, it, but I, I, it, it, I'm not anti-taboo. Uh -huh. So, so and, and in some way, this is one thing which, one way in which uh, conservatives and progressives have in common. So they take speech codes. There mm -hmm. are certain words that are taboo to say, you know. That there, there's one particularly taboo word, and there's like four others which are which are low grade taboo and so on. Mm -hmm. And you 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 know, and like a taboo, there's sort of a magic on it where even saying words that sound like it, even saying mm -hmm. even even if you put stars in it, it might it might make you think about it. And that's something which I think a conservative could get behind. And in yeah, fact, and sure in fact, it, it used to be. I'm old enough to remember when crusades against bad words was a conservative right. thing, and you know, liberals would mock it. And I, I think I don't think there's anything terrible about about that or that kind of thing. Um, it may actually be important for for a well-run society. What what bothers me is sort of taboo modes of thought. Where mm -hmm. There are certain questions we can't ask because they're taboo and it's forbidden to consider alternatives. And I think you, there are the normal strictures of politeness. There's also things you don't want to sort of just shout from the rooftops, but I do think it's important for us to to be able to discuss things. We discuss, well, why is this wrong? Why have we always done things this way? And you could say as a conservative, well, we should not be quick to overthrow them. Even, even if we don't have the right arguments right now, we shouldn't be so quick to overthrow them. But I, I do think that that I will defend the psychologist habit of saying, or the philosopher's habit more, of saying nothing should be off the table for discussion. Yeah, so I mean, I, I, this is this is a nuance friendly zone. Yeah, yeah. So let me first stipulate: I directionally agree with you that if the rules of discussion are su sufficiently open minded, good faith, non histrionic, that you should be able to have discussions about almost anything. The problem with my view of the problem with that view is that. It's not a great, um, that it's not a point that works at scale, 
By which I mean, if you and I are at the the Owl, whatever that place is where yeah. I first met you in in New Haven, we can talk about just about anything, and we're going to be polite and deferential enough and open minded enough to exchange ideas. But you know, th and I think this is just something that sort of the sort of the the classical philosophical tradition gets closer to the truth, and there are all sorts of problems with that too. But um, some things should not be discussed over social media. Some things should not be discussed on live TV, right? Like, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a Chestertonian, so I, I like dogma. I think dogma yeah. is good, right? Um, I'm a big Chesterton's fence guy, right? You know, it takes the time to come up with the arguments that justify getting rid of any dogma. And, um, and so take the example of slavery. The United States, we had a horrible war to get rid of, in part, to get rid of slavery, amended the Constitution a few times to make sure it can never come back. I don't think there's anything productive to have a conversation about, yeah, was it a mistake to end slavery? Certainly not on a big public scale, not on a university hall, because that to me is, it's, it's not actually a good faith, you know, sort of in, spirit of the enlightenment conversation. It's trolling at scale. And so some questions, I'm not, I'm not a Straussian and things. There's this some special conversation that only the, the select can have and all that kind of stuff. But I'm a big believer in good manners. Yeah. And, and, and so taboo is more, I think, properly understood as a function of good manners. The good idea, the good conception of taboos have as much to do with the sort of social peace that comes with having good manners and showing your fellow citizens respect. And that's a defensive taboo that I think is worthwhile. It's just, it's, it's always going to be a judgment to call to say, well, this taboo is good or this dogma is good and that one isn't. But you should approach the question with some care about how you approach it and how much you publicize it. Yeah, I, I, I think we're directionally aligned. I wouldn't think much of somebody who wanted to open up a discussion about bringing back slavery. Um, I, I think, and I, I, I have a feeling we're going to be aligned with this as well that there's a difference between good manners, politeness, and choices of who I'd want to associate with and so on, and what should be permitted, um, mm -hmm. what, what, what the state could stop. So I, would, I agree with you about slavery. On the other hand, um, I wouldn't support a university, even, even a private university, say, you cannot discuss this within our bounds. I can imagine them discouraging it. I can imagine social pressure being applied by people say, I don't want to discuss it. Because the problem is once you allow a sort of foot in the door, and, and you know, I, I heard you talk about, about uh, Skokie and, and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing, and maybe we disagree here, but my worry is the university gets legitimately, quite legitimately say, well, you can't debate slavery, you know, that's ridiculous. But once you give it the power to do that, they'll also say you can't debate that trans women are women. You mm -hmm. can't debate that affirmative action is a good idea. You can't debate that um, that Palestinian liberation is a fundamental moral good that 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 trumps Israelis' right, and so on and so forth. And and you and I would say, well, we can make the division between the permissible and the impermissible, but it won't be in our hands. And what makes us gods, anyhow? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I I agree with you about the, the the moral hazard problem, the slippery slope problem. These are real things. Where do you draw lines and all that kind of stuff? At the same time, I, I, let's keep it in the realm of the private university. If you're the president of a private university or either board of trustees of a private university, the overseers, the faculty, whatever, these people, their whole job in life is to draw lines, to make yeah. meaningful distinctions, to think critically about things. And it seems to me you don't have to have a, a philosophy of radical, anarchic libertarianism or you just go over the press, forget a slippery slope, you just go over the precipice of, of censorship. Um, but I, I'm the first to acknowledge I've lost that argument. <laughs> um, <laughs> the problem is, and I'm curious what you think about this, the problem is, is that a lot of the people, I mean, like, so my, among my big problems with the three presidents and the testimony thing and the arguments that you're getting from a lot of these schools is that, um, when on the defense about the anti-Jewish stuff, they invoke free speech principles, the principles yeah. that you're upholding here and these arguments, which are serious yeah. arguments, well-grounded in liberal political philosophy. Um, and 
serious rules that I think need to be treated with profound respect. At the same time, when not what went on offense, there's all sorts of police speech policing that goes on on these campuses about what you can discuss, how you can discuss it, when you can discuss it, what are the taboos. And it's this cognitive dissonance thing where you're invoking my principles to defend yourself when under the gun, when under the lights, but when you have free reign, you don't adhere to them at all. Right. I mean, that's, I mean, it's, we're getting far afield from, from no, I'm, you know, your stuff, but I'm kind of curious what you think about it. No, I'm um, so, you know, the three presidents, you know, <laughs> nobody can deny uh, that they really messed it up so much that one, one lost their job. Another one, the Harvard president is in trouble for unrelated reasons, but related mm-hmm. reasons. But I, th- well, first thing, I think that they were, that they were, and one reason why people were mad is even if they agree with the president's reluctance to say that that's forbidden uh, speech, they were enraged by what they saw as the hypocrisy. Mm-hmm. And perhaps rightfully so. Mm-hmm. So, so they would say, what if instead of from the river to the sea, they were chanting something that was, you know, negative towards black people or negative towards trans people or whatever. And who would doubt that these presidents would clamp down on these, on these people. Right. But in some way, this is why you more than me, because I, I, I'm, I'm a liberal, should be very worried about giving university presidents and university leaders the power to draw these lines, because you're conservative and they're liberal. They'll mm-hmm. draw the lines in ways that you will not want. So, so I can imagine a force for you, say, at least at the university level, no lines should be drawn outside of the sort of lines that are topic neutral, like you know, threatening people and, right. and slandering people and physic, you know, those sort of things, which is when the president said context matters, that's what they were saying. Yeah, no, look, I, I'm very sympathetic to that argument. It's the David French argument. Um, and it is by far the compromise that I am most willing to accept, which is if we can't have like, decently small c conservative institutions that uphold good manners and draw these distinctions the way i think they should be drawn okay if you say that can't be that can't happen and i hear that from left-wingers and right-wingers all the time then the only compromise i mean this is where the where liberalism comes from is this social compromise that says we're going to have rules that apply to everybody you know there's this guy who doesn't get a lot of attention uh james harrington who was a political philosopher in England, um, one of the architects, one of the classic expositors of, of classical republicanism. And he has this mental experiment where he explains how if you have two greedy people and one big piece of pie, the only way to guarantee that both will get a fair slice is one person gets the cut, but then the other person gets first choice of the slice. And so the incentive structure is such yeah. that you know, you're going to try to draw it as e- cut as evenly as possible because you know you're going to get second choice. That to me, that's a totally legitimate compromise for how these universities should think about things is let's not do social engineering for our team because we wouldn't want their team to do it to us. And that's, right. that's fair. And that's where I can meet you in the middle. Right. But and unfortunately, it's what goes on in conditions of minimal trust. You, right. you, you know, there's a separate question whether you should say, if there's a conservative institution or a conservative university, you say, well, that university should be allowed to, to draw the lines because they'll draw the lines pretty much to fit my intuition. And there's a case to be made for you even then that you should say there shouldn't be partisan line drawing. Right. But I'm also a big fan of pluralism. Yeah. Which means different institutions yeah. with different values, right? And you let a thousand flowers bloom. You can't there's certain minimal things. Again, you can't have slavery. We're talking about federalism, yeah. right? Um, you can't, you have to have the right of exit at any organization. Um, you know, even in the military, you have the right of exit. It just means you have to pay a steep price if you, if you desert, right? And yeah. that's fair. Um, and you have to know what that price is before you join. I, that's all fine. At the same time, it would not pain me terribly if at Notre Dame, a Catholic private institution, certain kinds of blasphemous, grotesquely sacrilegious speech were more heavily policed than they were at, say, Yale, right? It just, it's a Christian institution trying to teach Christian things. You don't have to be 
Cotton Mather about it, you know, or whatever. But you, it, it seems to me that that is part of pluralism is letting different institutions have slightly different rules um, because that's part of liberalism too. So, so I'm curious because it, 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 there's a consistent view there. And by parity of argument, you might say, look, if Harvard says you can chant from the river to the sea and you could call for the end of Israel, that's fine. But you can't say equivalent, you can't be critical of, say, trans rights. Mm -hmm. You might say, well, pluralism. They're a liberal university. They'll, they'll go that way. You don't, you know, nobody makes you go to Harvard. Go to Notre Dame instead. If you find, if you find that that sort of speech uh, code is unpalpable. Yeah, so the, the problem with that gets to your point, which is that, or the part we were talking about before, that's not Harvard's stated position. Harvard's stated position, and I'm, 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 I'm reducing it unfairly, is the speech we like is consistent with liberal values and free speech and decency and all of these wonderful things, and the speech we don't like isn't. And they don't say, hey, look, we are all children of Howard Zinn and Herbert Marcuse, and we're only interested in imposing our conception of power and we have this cultural Marxist view and dissenting views are not tolerated here because we won the Gramscian march through the institutions. So screw all you bourgeois liberals. They want credit for being bourgeois liberals while doing the social engineering stuff. That's not the deal. No, I like the argument. So you're saying there's an asymmetry. I'm treating these as this left versus right, just different polarities. But you're pointing out that it's entirely consistent for, for Notre Dame to say, we're going to ban speech that we view as sinful. Harvard can't say the parallel thing because they say we welcome free inquiry of all types. Right. And they, and they don't actually yeah. welcome it. Right. And so that's my problem. Like if it's, it's um, truth in advertising, say what your, 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 your first principles are and your, your, your underlying commitments are and don't have a double standard about it. And I mean, again, I think it would be stupid for Harvard to do. I think it'd be bad for Harvard. I think it'd be bad for the country if they said, okay, we're all Leninists now, but there's an honesty to it. That the kids who then say, hey, I can't talk about Adam Smith here, um, the school can say in an Aesopian way, yeah. you knew we were scorpions when you got on, <laughs> yeah. when you got on board, you know, and that'd be fine, you know? Yeah, no, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Um, but that's why I default to, you know, to, to at a certain level, not to draw lines at all. And, you know, not every, so, so I would, you know, I read the Yale Daily News because, because mm -hmm. I'm still faculty member at Yale and, and Peter Salovey, who's a departing president and a friend of mine, um, saw what other university presidents have done and what happened to me. I said, if I saw a bunch of, of, of people marching, declaring, you know, death to Israel, I'd call the police mm -hmm. and kick their asses out. And it was exactly the right thing to say because, you know, free speech absolutists don't get that upset at anything. We're, we're used to losing and donors love that sort of thing. But I actually think that's the wrong thing for him to say. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if they had permission to march and all that kind of stuff, yeah. that's one thing. If if they're disrupting class, I mean, like they're, that's right. The rules, you know, that's just right. simply rules, and that and rules should be followed. I, so I I I, I, I want to get to uh, something I'm kind of fascinated with, and I'm so scared to talk about. But since you write about it and you know about it, you can explain it. But before we get to that, one of the things I credit you with is for restoring my confidence that there are there actually is profound you and 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 what's it, John Tooby who recently passed away yeah. you know so like the two things i i think are serious about psychology are basically the stuff that you've done and uh and i'm really fascinated by evolutionary psychology yeah. and um but i in the 2000s um because i was when i was working on my first book i read a lot of theodore adorno and a lot of that, that, that Frankfurt school stuff. And, um, and it was really bad timing because there was this explosion of pop psychology stuff about how conservatives and liberals just have different brains. Yes. And, uh, the Republican mind, there was all this stuff out there. And whenever I scratched, like, even as a total layman with no training in the world of psychology, the studies that they base these sweeping statements about the authoritarian personality, you know, for the modern age stuff, it was these garbage, weird, stupid studies. And like, okay, so now we're supposed to be able to say that Ronald Reagan and Mussolini were the same personality type because kids in some lab spotted liberal kids spotted M's faster than W's in or something like that. And 
At the same time, since I've had to reevaluate so many of my positions in the last 10 years, I'm at least, and, and I've had to jettison my opposition to horseshoe theory, which we can talk about. Um, um, I'm curious, as someone who I actually respect and, and knows the literature, how much basis is there to the idea that conservatives and progressives have actually different brains, different subroutines, you know, different epistemologies? I mean, like, how much seriousness is there in all of that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question. Whatever the answer is going to be, it's not going to be a simple one. You know, mm -hmm. I, you know, for a while, there were a lot of psychologists saying, well, uh, liberals are smarter. Mm -hmm. There we go. You know, um, there's a huge literature on um, conservatives are more fearful and mm -hmm. a lot of studies suggesting they're more fearful and that drives them to more conservatism. And that research has fallen apart recently. A lot of studies mm -hmm. don't replicate and so on. And I think I think in this way, actually, there's sort of a pro diversity argument here, which is psychologists, particularly political psychologists, are, lean so liberal that the tr it's, it's impossible for the tribalism not to leak into their work. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I think the fact that there are a few conservative psychologists in this game has really improved our, our theorizing. So, okay, there are some differences. Here's, here's one difference which is real. And we could talk about what, what's really hard to figure out. First thing, as you know, conservatism and liberalism mean very broad things and mean right. different things in different countries. But take the, take the American model. And then another qualification is we don't know what makes people conservative versus liberal versus the consequences of becoming conservative or liberal. Mm -hmm. But here's a generalization. Psychologists like to talk about the big five personality traits. Um, liberals tend to be more open to experience. Conservatives tend to be more, more conscientious. And, um, you know, it's not an enormous difference, but it's a real difference. So explain that to me. So when you say open, to, like just doing new things? Yeah, so, so, so John Hyde talks about this, and the openness to new experience is for this to work, for this to be sort of non-circular, non it goes outside politics. So openness to new experience is stuff, is stuff like, you know, we like to try new foods. Mm -hmm. uh, you, like, you like to travel to different countries. You know, you could you could ask people a question. You ask also who tends to have more passports mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, conscientiousness is, you know, do you remember to water your plants? That sort of thing. And so it it fits a stereotype. Now, you don't know, of course, if this is just a fact that in America, conservatives and liberals tend to be different kinds of people with different mm -hmm. incomes and live in different things. And it could be a product of, of that. Um, as well. So we don't know what's the cause, but for the most part, you bring in a hundred liberals and a hundred conservatives, they'll differ in that, in that personality type. Okay. So that's, that's, that's very useful to me. And I should say, I forgot to mention Jonathan Haidt, I'm a big fan of. So, um, but so when you talk about how psychologists used to think that liberals were just smarter, um, it seems to me that like, I'm open to that as a, as a matter of survey research in, in so far as urban people, particularly urban people who are interested in taking surveys and participating in, yeah. in, in that kind of stuff are going to be like urban people. You know, it's one of the reasons why Jews are more liberal is they've been an urban people for a thousand years. And that means that, and lots of things come with that. You live in a more diverse place you know what uh was it a uh, stat luft mach du frei city air makes you free right there's certain things that come culturally with living in a urban more market oriented yeah. place that are going to culture enculturate certain attitudes and one of them is more education and all of that kind of thing right so as a sampling thing i think i could see how you could come to that without being tribal right um yeah, that's right similarly like if you're more rural, the conscientiousness that you talk about also comes with the necessity of not outsourcing a lot of the functions of day-to-day -day life to people you can hire, right? And then there's, there, you're, there's more, I mean, again, speaking wildly gross yeah. stereotypes, but like you, you're tending your own garden more, right? You are, um, you're watering your own plants because someone else isn't. 
um, you're not or you're 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 churning your own butter because you don't have you know Uber Eats or whatever. Yeah. I mean, like you can you can think about these things, but again, I don't think that's the real explanation for any of this. But I can see it be one of the things that distorts the the empirical data is like where you're drawing these people from, um, uh, being a factor. But none of that speaks to the way a lot of the bad stuff that drove me crazy was, which was that this was innate, right? That this is like yeah. people who are born conservative are bad or authoritarian or whatever. And people who are born liberal because of their innate wiring. That's, I mean, how much of a thing do you think, like, in, I don't remember this coming up in just babies, but is like, is there anything in the research about <laughs> kids under the age of four that, that would lend some credence to this conservative versus liberal thing? It's funny. I was, I was, talking to some colleagues and we were talking about research ideas and we were sort of trying to frame the question, are we innately liberal or innately conservative? Which mm -hmm. plainly that's, that's sort of a silly question at that crude level, but what sort of, what's not a crazy question is what sort of political instincts and political notions um, come naturally mm -hmm. and what, and what sort of notions are, are sort of have to be, you have to be enculturated in. And of course, that doesn't come with a value judgment either way. Right. All sorts of, un, you know, I, I think, you know, I think appreciating the wrongness of slavery is, is a, a hard fought cultural discovery that is not, we're not born with. Right. Um, so born with does not mean good, but it, it's a question you could ask. I think certain social institutions, for instance, and this is some work I done with, um, with actually my, my wife, Christina Starman's and, and uh, Mark Sheskin, where um, we we review the literature and find that it is very unnatural, and and not what people do not like when resources are distributed equally. Mm -hmm. um, people want people differ, and for the most part, people want a safety net, and children too. They want everybody to get something, but there's a very strong, I think, universal bias that distributions be re distributed in part based on merit. Mm -hmm. So if you work twice as hard as me and somebody, some, some, you know, God gives you 10 and me 10, children will object and adults mm -hmm. will object all around the world. And only very few will sort of respond by saying, no, this is a better system overall. So I don't know the answer, I think, but I think it is a good question. Then there's another question, which is to what extent is political orientation heritable? Mm -hmm. And I think it's a question you could ask if, if, I think there are so many other factors that push you towards your politics that I don't think there'd be a huge effect of the genes. Just mm -hmm. because, you know, if, 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 if you're raised, you know, on the Upper West Side, you know, um, and, and you go to certain schools, you have certain friends, that's really going to push you, mm -hmm. regardless of, 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 where, of, of your genetic makeup. But to the extent in edge cases is determined by personality, personality is pretty heritable. Mm -hmm. There are some kids who are just born anxious, some kids who are born calm, some who are extroverted, some who are introverted, and so on. And the genes play, you know, people say like 50% of the variation. So my bet is, and I don't think this is in any way should be offensive to anybody politically, that my bet is that genes play some role. Yeah. yeah. That, that strikes me as fair, for sure. But that's also, you know, the the role of institutions culture is just so hugely important, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, it used to drive my dad crazy that the most doctrinaire communists in the Politburo were always described as the conservatives. <laughs> and, um, and it just shows you there's a huge, and, but the, it's yes. a fair characterization given the context where you're operating in the Soviet Union, right? I mean, this is the point that Samuel Huntington yeah. makes about how, conservatism and radicalism are the only two major philosophical approaches to politics that are entirely context de dependent. So a conservative in France in 1790 is a monarchist, right? But a conservative in America in 1830 is going to be a, maybe a, a Madisonian, right? Because it, it, you're, it depends what you want to conserve. Yeah. And, and so you could be born with the same personality types, but into different contexts. And what, whether that makes you a liberal or a conservative could be very different depending upon all of these other extraneous things. And, and I actually think that that's maybe a better way of looking at the contribution genes are likely to make. And I'll give you an, an analogy, which is 
religiosity turns out to be pretty heritable. Mm -hmm. But that's not like there's genes for being that, that, that make you inclined towards Judaism or Islam or Christianity. Right, right. What it means is that there's genes that incline you to take this stuff really seriously. And it right. means you go to, you go to church all the time or you go to synagogue all the time. Right. Or right. you meditate all the time. You do, you do Buddhist practices. And my, my bet is that politics is going to be the same thing, which is my bet is that there's, there's going to be genes in a rough sense that predispose you, for instance, to be a real zealot. Mm -hmm. And you can mm -hmm. be a left-wing zealot, you can be a right-wing zealot, conservative, liberal. Wherever you put into your cultural shape where you are, you know, you're, maybe you're a Maoist. Maybe you're, you're, you're pushing for Barack Obama. But, but whether you're kind of a meh, this is something I do some of the time versus I'm devoting my life to it, probably has a genetic push. I'll also say one cool thing that's been done in psychology recently, because you know, it'll, it'll make you feel better about, about your, your brushes with right-wing authoritarian ideas <laughs> is that people have studied left-wing authoritarianism. It's sort of a, a brand new construct in psychology. And I associate with people like Lee Jessam and Phil Tetlock, though I'm not, I'm not sure to credit, where people pointed out that there's a sort of sim, a, a mirror image authoritarian view you could find mm -hmm. on the left. And, um, and you, could, you could give scales to test it. So right now, the scales that determine whether or not you're authoritarian are basically to what extent do you hold conservative views. It's one of the problems in our field, like just like scales that that you know study uh, narrow mindedness often will define narrow mindedness as holding views that are non liberal. Right, right. So that's I mean this is this is my my primary indictment of Adorno's yeah. authoritarian personality is that he built into it that if you were a ardent Stalinist. That didn't. That meant you were you scored very low That's when right. it called the F scale of where F stands for fascism, right? And so, like, perfectly comfortable saying Hitler's worse than Stalin. There are good arguments for that. There are bad arguments for that. But like, if you're really rah rah Stalin, don't tell me that you're like not an authoritarian, not a a a a, a bad person. That's right? right. I mean, and that's the thing that drove me crazy it is like let's just shine a light on the political people we don't like and then attribute it to psychology and, and, and yeah and you know first that's a, that's a nice way to think about it which there probably is an authoritarian personality right to some extent built in to some extent you know developed through parenting in, in your life it just is sort of politics neutral you could be a, right you could be authority you could be, be a stalinist you could be you could be a fascist and so on right Right. Um, no, I think that I th that that's sort of where I come down on this. Um. All right. So I, I I promise not to keep you too long, but um. There's this thing I had. I always have to relook it up. The and I, we talked a little bit about language, and I think we talked a little bit about Chomsky last yeah. time. But the Sapir Whorf hypothesis. Yes. Right. Which basically says that the way you think, the language you use, changes the way you think, and so therefore there are different people from different cultures and different languages have different relationships to their ability to reason and think and all these kinds of things. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yeah, that's exactly a fair way of putting it. And there's a lot of... Is it of, a live proposition still? It's, I gather it's very controversial. It is very controversial. Um, and it's definitely a live proposition. I could, I, you know, I could go to my department and, and reach out and touch a couple of people who believe it. I mm -hmm. think it's, it's for the most part been proven false. Okay. I think... It tends to get blurred together with things which are, are obviously true, which is mm -hmm. that having a language gives you certain cognitive powers that a creature without a language couldn't have. Mm -hmm. You know, you could right now think about things using language that, that if you were forbidden to, you'd be, you'd be kind of screwed. Um, but people have put it to the test. And they've, they've, you know, different language, different color terms. So that affect how you think about color. Different languages talk about time in different ways and motion different ways. And what you often find is in laboratory tests, a fraction of a second difference in reasoning, mm -hmm. which from a theoretical standpoint is really interesting. From a practical standpoint, isn't interesting at all. Mm -hmm. And so I think the difference between me as a pretty much monolingual English speaker and a monolingual speaker of Korean or Navajo or Italian is just considering language nothing. Mm-hmm. And we, we differ, obviously, in immense ways because of our cultures. But, but the language itself, I don't think, shapes how we think in different ways. And this, by the way, is how, come, how translation is so successful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not always perfect. Like, there's often gaps. You, you know, 
you know, you have a word like uh, the Yiddish word nachas, which mm-hmm. doesn't have an English translation. But if I tell you it means being proud of your kids, well, now right. you got it. You know, right. there's no magic here. They just have a word for it. And so for the most part, we translate pretty smoothly. Um, do you ever see the movie Arrival? Oh, yeah. yeah. Very, so like, very Warfian movie. Yeah, I mean, that was like, so in the, just for listeners to know, in the movie, this this linguist who ends up speaking the language of these aliens, and it cha- it rewrote the structure of her brain so that she could conceive of things outside of linear time and see the future and all that kind of stuff. I think it made her capable of time travel. Right, right. Or mental projection into yeah. time, time, time travel. And like... And they just took it as like this given that, that this is how language works on brains. And I thought that was sort of a it fascinating was, sort of concession to a really obscure <laughs> theoretical thing. You know, it, 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 it's interesting, but, but, but movies, maybe not surprisingly, movies often embody different psychological theories. And, uh, and this one, this one really bought into morphine theory. And, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a pluralist for this, too. I thought it was a great movie. A lot of fun, mm-hmm. and so they're they're entitled to buy into their bad psychological theory. Some some movies buy into a strong genetic determinism, sort of bad seed movies. Mm-hmm. You know, oh my God, we we adopted this kid, but it turns out to be the, the love child of two serial killers. So right. we're right. going to be in big trouble. And right. you know, that's a theory too. I think that one is actually not has has some truth to it. Um, there's uh, but yeah, movie, movies tend movies and books, and they tend to. There's, a, there's probably some line you could quote better than me, which is that <laughs> everybody has a theory of, of, of human nature. And if you, if, if you don't think you do, it's just because you, it is so deeply ingrained, you can't think of an alternative. So uh, just a little writerly advice if you don't know about it, because I know you are interested in these kinds of things. There's a website called TV Tropes. Oh, yeah. And it is an encyclopedic database of various pop culture archetypes um and narratives and it goes it runs the gamut from video games to classic literature yeah. to tv shows and it's incredibly useful for illustrating exactly this point is that they're really only like it's very Jungian, right they're only like yep. 50 storylines and you just play them out differently with different characters in different contexts and i i kind of like that that's there's something profoundly conservative about science fiction because what one of the, I think the key tenets of conservatism, which I think you're probably sympathetic to, is I'm actually kind of curious if you're not. That would be really interesting. Is that human nature has no history, right? That the the changes in our genetic makeup. I mean, there's some, right? We're more tolerant of lactose yeah, or whatever, lacto- right? Lactose is probably it. Yeah, but like it's 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 on a very long time horizon. Yeah. And the reality is, is if, you know, as I often put it on here, is like if you took a baby born today and you put it in a time machine back to Sweden in the year 1000, it would grow up to rape and pillage the English countryside. Yeah. And if you took a Viking baby and sent it to New Rochelle in 2023, it would grow up to be an orthodontist, right? Because the the people are, the, 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 the material, the crooked temper of humanity remains constant. And, and the, what I love about science fiction is that all the bells and whistles and gizmos and all that kind of stuff they're used to illustrate this point that the characters are still motivated by the same things they were in game of thrones as they are in dune right yeah. and that's a really important insight for a lot of people because a lot of people have this progressivist view that simply because we're born today we're somehow innately better than the people who were born 100 years ago yeah no I, I i strongly agree with that i mean i'm i'm in my future would be a star trek future if they if they you know freeze me and i die i hope to wake up and it's this the the star right. trek world where you know world of, of abundance due to replicators and space travel and interstellar travel and everything but of course you you see the movies and they're the same people and mm-hmm. and then you know you, you read the, the odyssey and it's the same right. people and right. right in some ways the demands of fiction that something which didn't have the same people like us would be uninterpretable and unenjoyable but in some way i think it just captures a basic truth you know ian McEwen points out that the fact that we could read like the old testament and get it Get the stories mm-hmm. and say, "Oh yeah, I see what's going on there. That's that's funny. That's a trick. That's a right. Just just talks about the constancy of humanity through time." Yeah, I mean that's the amazing thing about Shakespeare is like once yeah. you acclimatize to the language, you're like, "Holy crap!" You know, I mean, this is very modern brained in a lot of ways. Yep. Um, you know, you write a lot about weird uh, Western yep. educated industrialized something or other, right? Um, 
and how too many of our studies are dominated by these people. And it tells you how affluent college kids think, but not yep. necessarily how normal people think. Right. Um, there's nothing in there that's an argument about innate differences between people, right? That's all no. acculturated. That would, the idea being, and this pushes back against what we were just talking about, which is uh -huh. there's a human nature that's evolved, but it admits of variation. Um, you know, right. yeah, we're like, we're like the people of, uh, you know, um, you tell me about raping and pillaging. I think that's, that's immoral. I'm against that. And, uh, but a thousand years ago, I put, oh, that's what we do. That's what we do during war right. time. So, so there are differences and so much of psychology has studied, um, you know, rich, educated, industrialized, rich democracies. And, you know, basically for the most part, American college students. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that it's not only, this is an argument that Joe Henrik and his colleagues make, and Joe's a really interesting guy. You might want to talk with him. Um, but. It turns out not only is this, you know, a specific slice of the human population, but it's an unusual slice. Right. It's an unusual, very strange slice. To take one thing that, that, that we end up talking about, we are very, you know, we are, are, we try very hard not to be nepotistic and tribal. We, we work, we, we, we say it's really wrong for a leader to hire his family. We say it's really right. wrong for us to hate the other group because of the color of the skin. Those are, un those are unusual views. They're weird views in both sense. Um, notions, Henrik argues that certain notions about agency and moral responsibility um, and, and equality are weird. And so I think a better psychology would just incorporate more of humanity. Yeah. And let's just be honest that, again, it's all about scale and lanes and institutions. There's nothing wrong necessarily with any of those instincts. No. Like you want something better for your own kids than you want for a stranger. And you might think it's wrong, but like you're not going to change it, right? There's never been a society where people didn't want to show favors to their own kids over the kids of somebody they don't know, right? Which is one of the reasons why in political talk, I hate it when people talk about how all of America is one family, right? And that we should, you know, or, or um, I remember when, uh, th this comes up every five or 10 years, um, where, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton is the one I used to always tee off on about it, where she said, we need to move beyond the idea. There's any such thing as somebody else's child. And that might be as a utopian set of first principle morality superior, but it's total folly <laughs> in dealing yeah. with actual human beings right i mean you have to you have to set up a standard that people can live with and if you're in a burning house and there are a bunch of kids in there i'm going to try to save as many of them as i can but i'm going to start with mine yeah and that's just how human beings are and i, th I think there's a morality and a importance to that that you can't have a society where people aren't have a certain sort of parental emphasis on making sure their own kids are okay but at the same time you're not going to get rid of it I, I I agree with that for the most part. There's sort of this this line in in moral philosophy, which is you know, um, ought implies can. Which is mm -hmm. if I tell you this is the way you should live, well, I presumably that means you can live that way. And to tell people that their familial bonds mean nothing is is to ask them something which is humanly impossible. And more than that, I think just when I reflect on my morality, there are things I do where I say, well, this is the wrong thing to do, but I feel compelled to do it. But then there's things like, you know, devoting time and energy and love to my sons and mm -hmm. as opposed to, to strangers. And not only do I do it, I don't think it's wrong. Right. I think the edge cases come about when you wonder how much should you prioritize your own versus others. So For yeah, sure. I'd rescue my kids out of a burning building before anybody else. but. I would hopefully come back for the other kids, for instance, once for I sure. got my I agree with that entirely, right? It's all about matters of, of degree, yes. you know, and, and priority. But like, you know, time is finite. Yep. Abilities are finite. And so you're just going to prioritize certain things. I mean, this, this gets to the heart of, you know, the basic thesis of my book, which was that the most corrupting things in life have to do with human nature. Yeah. And, and so, you know, when you talk about like, not giving special treatment to family, you know, in business and that kind of stuff. When we try to get, when we try to get a Afghan government to put things out to bid for contracts, they were like, are you crazy? Someone from the other yeah. tribe could get this contract. Of course I'm going to give it to my nephew. 
And that's the natural thing, yeah. right? It's the unnatural thing is to expect, you know, impersonal, disinterested, good government that doesn't actually look favorably upon your clan, your family, or or whatever. And that's that's where we get the word nepotism, right? It comes out of the Catholic Church where all these cardinals and stuff were giving special treatment to their quote unquote nephews. Yeah. Um, to the point where the institution realized we got to come up with some rules to prevent this from happening because it's so corrupting. And it's a good case that as institutions, as states, as as businesses, we can say, look, this is human nature. We acknowledge it and we are choosing to override it. So right. if I'm looking to hire uh, to, to choose graduate students, I'm not allowed to choose members of my own family. If I'm right. awarding For a sure. prize um, and my own kids apply, They'll take away the decision process from me. And right. in some way, I'll be frustrated. But we can appreciate that in some ways, you know, we, we that's want the pie cutting it. thing. That's right? the pie cutting thing. That's right. Right. But like if you own your own business and you want it to be a family business, making your kid the head of the business when you retire, there's nothing wrong with that because it's your business. Right. And it may be a bad decision. And if you have, if it's a big business and you've got shareholders, you probably can't do it. That's right. But if it's a privately held, you know, this is. It's normal. It's natural. And there's nothing, no reason to get in the way of it. Um, my, my, if I could, and my big complaint with so much of moral philosophy and moral psychology, um, including a lot of the moral philosophy, which, which we've been talking about, you've been, you've been mentioning, is it's all about the interactions of strangers. Mm -hmm. And I think you get a better insight when you look at advice columns. So, so you look at advice. I love advice columns. Like I read Dear Prudence from Slater, or used to. Um, and, you know, and advice columns are never. Oh my God! There's a runaway trolley, and it's going to kill one person. I got to right. do it through a switch. <laughs> Advice columns are always, you know, my brother-in-law borrowed money from me and won't pay it back. Right. My my uh, my husband watches too much porn. My 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 kids are ungrateful, and they're always about family. And I think the real a real moral psychology and a real moral philosophy have to come to grips with the ties we have, the family, and then the the hard moral questions are often, you know, what what their limits are. I could go on forever, but and I want to, we're running long, and I promise not to keep you too long. So thank you so much for doing this. 